So thank you everyone for coming to today's presentation for the Canadian Managed Alcohol Program study. We're really excited to have some really knowledgeable uh, presenters today. So we have Donna, Morgan, and Nick who are coming from Island Health and have this really cool integrated individualized map um, that I think we could all learn from and kind of figure out how parts of this could fit into our own programming. So I'm going to pass it on to Nick right now um, and this, these wonderful folks will do a quick introduction. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and potentially good evening um, to our Canadian colleagues across Canada. Um, what a nice, uh, nice conversation that we're hoping to have with you. Um, we've pulled together basically a, a maybe a 20 minutes or so presentation, um, depending on how long each of us speak. And we wanted to share with you some of what we've learned. And we're gonna talk a bit about the policies, the workflows, the assessments, um, all throughout this presentation, how we arrived at where we're at today. And so I'm joined by um, my interdisciplinary colleagues uh, uh, from two different program areas and their names obviously are put on the screen. So Donna, Dr. Donna Buna out of Pharmacy Services and Morgan Bach from MHSU in the Integrated Case Management Team. Uh, Morgan and Donna, do you uh, wanna say anything about either of yourselves before we go to the... Um, not really, except that, you know, I, I personally have learned so much in the last couple of years being involved with this program and um, I continue to learn and it, it, it's great working with Morgan and Nick and, and sharing our, our journey which continues still to this day. So. Yeah, thanks Nick. Um, I think I, I have that several folks on this uh, call and uh, again, I'm, I'm Morgan Bach. I'm the clinical coordinator uh, in mental health and substance use with Island Health for the intensive case management team service in the South Island. So we have a, a few teams there. And yeah, this has been uh, quite the journey. Uh, you know, we just had our two year anniversary um, of our community outreach scatter model IMAP program. So it's, uh, yeah, it's been pretty exciting and something that we needed for a long time in our community. So really looking forward to sharing with you what we've learned and continue to learn. Well, and on behalf of um, our Island Health family, the three colleagues uh, that uh, are presenting for you today, um, just like to acknowledge the traditional unceded territory of three cultural families that um, in the geographic areas that we provide health care, um, the Kwakwakiwak, New Channel, and Coast Salish people. And, um, you know, from my heart, uh, I uh, find myself continually uh, seeking to reconnect with both the land as well as my heart and the, my place in this world. And some of the work that we get to do with managed alcohol has supported my learning journey in so many ways. And so it is with respect and gratitude for the uh, uh, cultural families that I just mentioned that uh, we bring some of our learnings to you today. So the next couple of slides, we're just gonna talk a little bit about the background and the structure as to how we arrived uh, in the last meeting that some of you may have been at. Um, I did mention formulary, and I think that Donna has this slide. Right, yeah, so um, in how did it happen that, you know, we started the Manage Alcohol program? Well, in British Columbia, we have a, uh, a BC-wide hospital formulary system, so there, there's a provincial group that meets and and approves things added to a hospital formulary. And what happened, um, what there was a submission to the BC group to add, um, I think first vodka and then beer 
way back in um, 2017, 2018 to the BC formulary group, um, there was a, 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 a program in, in St. Paul's, but that I think, you know, it, it sounded like it was unclear where the alcohol was coming from and probably the staff were just doing what they could to, to make the program happen. And, and so the pharmacy at St. Paul said, we, we need to formalize this. We need to, to put some more uh, controls and into place. So um, both beer and wine were, or beer and vodka, I'm sorry, were added to the BC formulary. And once that happened, there was a group in Island Health that said, okay, let's, and what the British Columbia Health Authority group said that it must be part of an organized managed alcohol program. Um, so we got together, I think in December of um, 2019 and started putting together some policies and procedures for Island Health um, for um, when we talked both about a community program and a inpatient program. And then of course, we, we all talk about AAC before COVID and after COVID, I don't know if we can say after COVID yet, um, but then COVID hit in March of that year and there was a real energy to get this program going in the community to support um, some of the uh, marginalized groups there and Morgan's um, integrated case management team. So we actually started first with the community group and, and then a couple of months later started inpatient program. And, and the two programs are very different. So that's a little bit how we got started in um, the managed alcohol program. The difference between the two programs too is for the inpatient program, we follow the BC formulary service and we only have beer and vodka which is procured by pharmacy services and provided to the inpatient wards in a controlled manner. It, it's considered a controlled substance. So it's handled like a narcotic and controlled drug and um, it's counted and, and documented it because uh, it's subject to diversion, obviously. Um, where in the community, uh, they procure the alcohol, uh, the team procures it themselves from the, um, the liquor store. So, and they, they will get different types of alcohol based on clients' desires and needs. And maybe Morgan could correct me on that if I'm, I'm wrong. So that's kind of uh, how we got started. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, John. I'll just add about the procurement. We are still like working on a way to have a better system. Like right now, we do like an email order with a local liquor store. We send it to them on Friday and they have it ready for us to pick up on Sunday, but it does kind of take some unnecessary manpower. So we are still kind of working um, to figure out a better system, but we do have more flexibility, um, which is a definite um, benefit to this system. We do stick to like a similar price point, but do offer a couple different types of beer as well as different percentage types of beer um, and then vodka. And we have, we have done a couple of vodka drinks, but the price point is, is much higher for clients. Uh, Ron, Nick, and Morgan, I, is it safe to move to the next one or no? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think so. We, I think we'll expand on some of that later, maybe. Yeah. Well, um, folks, you'll probably hear the three of us um, interact with one another throughout this presentation <laughs> in ways where we kind of rely on each other's brain trust to get through it together. And so uh, you'll notice that um, we, we definitely have a team approach and sometimes we don't always know what the other's gonna say or do. And so <laughs> we kind of, uh, we want you to know that uh, the collaboration is, is, uh, is built on a lot of trust um, amongst us. So wanting you to, to see here the the overview of some of the most, uh, I would say, stand out. We want you to know the themes, the core, uh, uh, core componentry, uh, the values and principles that went into and influenced the policy design, the assessment, and so on. Um, so first and foremost, really, the what individual 
individualized managed alcohol plan means at Island Health um, is that we're offering folks um, an alternative to, uh, say, a medical detox scenario with uh, um, alternative to um, abstinence, perhaps. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's basically what we're attempting to do is offer uh, people experiencing severe alcohol use disorder an opportunity to be able to more, you know, self-determine their own care pathway. And, 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 and in doing so, what, we, what we've attempted to design into the program component tree is really an individualized plan for each person. So we have to, we have to do a number of different steps in order to understand what each um, plan might be and look like and consist of for each person. And on the core components uh, side of this particular slide, um, we, you know, have a number of different ways and tools that we're using to be able to do this. Um, things like policies and procedures, and later on we'll talk a little more about assessments and order sets and um, some of the, the values and principles really are related to harm reduction, cultural safety and humility, trauma and violence informed practice. Um, we want to be able to ensure that that transdisciplinary approaches are taken while we work through the um, complexities of our own system to make a simple and easy to access program for patients for clients and for residents in different levels of care. So that's a, a quick little fl uh, flyover of, of some of the things that we've been working toward. Um, I'm going to move to the next slide about where we're at today. Um, I think that this one is still me. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. thanks Morgan. Um, so provincially, uh, you may have heard Morgan and, and Donna talk a little bit about this in the order in which we started. Um, and we noticed uh, right away uh, during COVID that um, we needed to stand up some um, managed alcohol programs in the community, community in a very urgent manner. And so um, what we did was we borrowed from uh, the local expertise and support from our colleagues at UVic, like Dr. Bernie Pauly, and we created um, a, a uh, to the best of our ability, and I want to say give or take about April, May 2020, a community uh, program in the Victoria area. And then, um, as Donna mentioned a little while ago, uh, in July, we had our first um, patient in an acute care setting in the Nanaimo area at the Nanaimo uh, General Hospital. And so what we want you to know also provincially is that um, exciting work uh, towards regulatory change for the access to wholesale pricing. And so that's a, a slower go. Um, and what that will mean is that we'll be able to provide um, our you know, clientele with uh, a better pricing uh, for those that are accessing it in the community and long-term care. And then pharmacy will have better access to uh, wholesale pricing as well. So I, I understand that our ministry colleagues are working diligently on what criteria might actually meet different regulations. And um, we're participating in that. And I hope that our, our colleagues in, in other health authorities in British Columbia are also participating in that work. I uh, also want you to know that when it comes to um, our island health context, where we're at today, education for IMAP continues rolling out re regionally. Right now, um, like I said, in 2020, we started with one community and one inpatient, and we've expanded in the last two years to um, a number of different uh, long-term care facilities and seven inpatient uh, or acute facilities. And th those numbers are changing quite uh quite significantly and we're, we're wanting you to know that while that expansion appears good, two years of extremely hard work and we're not there yet and we've got a long way to go. So wanting you to know that uh, that is how we see ourselves, that we still have a long way to go on all of this. 
maybe I'll switch to the next slide then if um, either of my yeah. colleagues wants to speak to this. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I can start for sure. Um, yeah, so as, as Nick um, has mentioned, it, it, I think, appears like as of today, like, oh, oh my goodness, we've done all this work and we're at like a fully operational um, status island wide. Um, but yeah, it is still, there's still a lot of work to do, but I, I am really proud of like the, the openness and, and willingness to even think about IMAP as an option. Um, you know, I, I've worked in this field for close to 20 years now, and we've been advocating for IMAP, you know, for many years prior to COVID happening. And so when COVID arose and we, we had an opportunity to create it, we, we kind of ran with it. And so I do want to acknowledge, um, Nick had mentioned uh, Bernie Polly, but uh, Megan Brown, who's a PhD candidate uh, uh, working with Bernie Polly, was a huge part in the development of our community IMAP program, which, um, yeah, originally really arose out of um, isolation requirements and the thought that we needed to kind of manage people's withdrawal in the community. Uh, it quickly shifted into our, our now fully integrated uh, managed alcohol program with the ICM team. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about where we're at with the community program and, and then kind of um, how that's transitioned into our uh, inpatient and long-term care um, programs as well. So as it stands today, um, IMAP is offered as a care plan through our intensive case management teams in Victoria here. Um, so we're, we are only able to provide that to 12 clients across the two teams, um, which, which is a small amount, but this is also, you know, a, an intervention um, that is designed for, you know, not for, you know, binge drinkers, but for folks that have chronic and persistent and severe substance use disorder where, other um, interventions have failed. Um, and, and this is also a decision that they're making around how you know they want to direct their care. So um, I definitely see there more there being a, a need for different types of community IMAP. And I think we're starting to make some headway with our community health services around that. But the IMAP we provide is, is probably for our most um, complex and uh, concurrent folks that have a lot of health comorbidities and um, are experiencing the greatest harms related to their alcohol use. Um, so clients on our team receive IMAP uh, screening and ass assessments twice daily uh, by our nurses or social work staff. So we're unable to um, have unregulated care providers do that screening and assessment piece. Um, you know, I, I think that we will work towards that in the future, and we're going to talk about that a bit more, so I won't go down that rabbit hole. Um, and so, yeah, the clients are seen twice daily um, and are given kind of set dosages that are based on a clinical order set we created and in collaboration with their primary care provider. Um, and we are really blessed in Victoria that all of our primary care providers are addiction med medicine docs as well. Um, so we work with them around the dosing and, and any changes. Um, and so they're seen twice daily and provided a set amount. Um, then they also receive wrap, the wraparound support that the intensive case management team provides. So we are doing case management. Uh, we're doing medication, medication management. Um, we have Indigenous support workers doing cultural support, um, as well as other peer outreach workers providing um, support ac ac accessing other um, community resources, as well as the psychosocial rehabilitation goals. Um, and so, yeah, we really got hit the ground running with the community program, and we quickly realized hey, we're going to need an inpatient program to support these folks when they go into hospital. Um, as well as Nick uh, alluded, we, we had started talking about this before COVID, um, and then it kind of stalled a bit, and I really saw COVID um, as the mechanism that kind of reopened that conversation. So um, we still have some work to do with the transitions between the programs, but we have made a lot of progress. Um, 
I think a big area that we still need to work out is like my team is doing paper wellness uh, checks, um, which again, we'll talk about later, um, whereas some of the other programs are moving to a fully online system. And so while we chart basically in every uh, progress note in the electronic health record, what the client's dosing is, there still is an opportunity for a client to be admitted to hospital. And unless they're you know, aware of the client and are looking at our progress notes, they, they could miss that they're on map. So I uh, just wanna flag that as, as something that is a challenge still for us, but that we're working through. And I don't know, Donna, if you wanna talk a bit more about the inpatient program and our work towards long-term care. Um, sure, yeah. So I, I think that this graphic, I kind of asked that it be included because it, it kind of, as we evolved, uh, realized that there's different levels of IMAP that need to happen or are happening and are kind of uh, grassroots growing. Um, you know, there's all the community NGOs and First Nations uh, groups that support people. Um, you know, with the managed alcohol, which health authority has nothing to do with. And um, then, of course, the ICM team is health authority approved. So it's, it's much more structured and regulated and documented. And just, um, and acute care is obviously very regulated and policies and procedures are laid out because these people are admitted to various wards within the hospital that might not have um, a lot of knowledge around a, um, um, substance use disorders or anything like that. So uh, things are well laid out, but just, just to show how things have evolved. Well, we have, we have three or four, I think right now in long-term care, we're just getting to finalizing the clinical order set for long-term care. So, um, and figuring out, you know, how people move back and forth. But I think Morgan uh, talked about that, that transitions, you know, uh, patients and clients move in between these places in the system and, mm -hmm. and, and utilizing technology and utilize to make sure that people have the information they need. If they, like, I think the first guy that we had was, in the community and he broke his hip. I think that was it. And then he ended up in acute care. So, you know, these things happen, they move between different levels of care. So um, that's why I, I kind of like this graphic. So I, I think we can go on to the next one, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Donna. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to add about those um, transitions of care. Um, we really see our, um, you know, the work happening in long-term care right now is critical um, for our community IMAP folks. Um, as we know, um, and I guess this is a lesson I've learned and I wanted to share with the group here, uh, this work is very palliative. Um, the ICM work has always been, but IMAP especially, because um, these are folks, you know, with a lifetime of, of chronic severe alcohol use and um, their health is, is not, um, you know, at its peak. So um, the ability to have transitions into long-term care, um, the development of IMAP and these services has really opened up um, a quality of life for folks that they have not received historically. So I'm really excited about this opportunity and that our, our partners are open and, and willing to work on these care plans. So it is really great to see. Thanks, Nick, if you want to go back. Um, I just uh, had Nick add these pictures uh, today. Uh, these are two art pieces done by one of our IMAP clients. Um, and he, he gifted them to the team. And so uh, the, the photo on your left is um, a warrior who um, he described as the IMAP team. Um, mm -hmm. And then the photo on the right is uh, the dancer. And uh, he described that as his spirit that was able to be um, you know, fully seen and, and acknowledged through this program. And um, you know, I, I have a, a ton of stories of, of just 
again, the quality of life improvements that IMAP has allowed um, folks uh, to explore. And a big part of it has been um, the ability to, to have resource, um, not only in time and emotion, um, but also funds uh, to create art again for, for um, a lot of our Indigenous uh, clients. So I just wanted to share that. This might be me. Uh, yes, Nick, it's you. <laughs> so wanting folks, like practically speaking, the, I wanted to share with you uh, like how we're communicating, how we're implementing, how we're educating. And so um, one of the things that, uh, that we have as an asset is an intranet page where all of the assessments, all of the listed uh, that are in bullets here are listed on this particular intranet page. Uh, for all team members to uh, benefit from interacting with. And it's um, basically a go-to. Uh, what I noticed uh, when we first launched it in September 2020, um, that we there was a lot of traffic on the site. And what we have done continuously is uh, update the materials. And so the more we learn about the way clients, uh, residents, and patients would like IMAP to work for them, the more we need to update all of our assets like um, workflows and, and uh, you know, brochures and things like that. Uh, and so all of, the, all of those materials we have shared with Brittany and they are posted on the uh, CMAP uh, webpage. And so everything that we've got, we've uh, shared uh, openly knowing that uh, others may benefit and make it their own as well. Um, so that's the intranet page. And then second, um, should I just keep going or? Yeah. Yeah, yep. this is here, Nick. Okay. And when it comes to the education that we have done up and down the island, uh, really wanting folks to, to, to know one of the things that we did was invite only. So we would get invited to places when the, when the space was ready for us. And so if we were presenting in Tofino or if we were presenting in Nanaimo, it was because the local leadership and the local point of care providers asked for some education on this. And we did our best uh, to start by interacting with say the local context of uh, how it's different in rural remote versus how it's different in urban. And what we would do is we would tailor, um, based on a standardized template, we would tailor some of the nuances and the lessons that uh, learned that we would like to share with different areas up and down the island. And so that was the approach. We tried to do like an individualized approach to IMAP, which is all about being you know, uh, contextually specific and tailoring to the needs. So we try to weave that principle of individualization even into our education. Um, we also borrowed, and you'll see on the screen here, Harm Reduction 101, kudos and props to our colleagues at Interior Health. I believe it was in 2018, if I'm, if I'm wrong, I apologize, that they created a really great Harm Reduction 101. So it's about a 30 minute e-learning course for folks to get a flyover of a bunch of different things to do with harm reduction. And so that's another educational asset. And then for colleagues who might be uh, wanting an online certificate. Our um, we've got a group uh, in British Columbia that is the British Columbia Center on Substance Use, and we borrowed a lot of their materials for our assessments, which we'll talk about shortly. And they also have a certificate program through University, I believe, of British Columbia. So those, those are what we've got right now. And um, we continue to try and find new ways to interact with folks about it. But uh, when it comes to the actual doing of the work. We had about 51 hour sessions up and down uh, the island between September 2020 and now. Uh, we keep getting invitations. Invitations have died down in the last few months, but um, we keep getting invited uh, for folks that maybe they want a refresher for their teams and, 
and that kind of thing. And boy, oh boy, do we ever learn a lot when we're interacting with point of care because we design this program and we, you know, the people that come like nursing and allied health physicians, operational leaders, they all have all these questions that perhaps we didn't think of, or there's ooh, an idea that we want to try and grow and make regional. And so those are the things that that's the approach that we're attempting to use in this um, transdisciplinary regional education. Um, and so it's not enough to just write a policy and words on paper. Uh, what we've what we've attempted to do is is go out and be with people and interact and learn together. Yeah, and I have to say it, it's been a great learning experience for me to do those presentations, but I also did do pharmacy only presentations, um, uh, you know, to talk about the geeky pharmacy stuff like um, drug interactions with alcohol and dosing and figuring out doses. And it was a good opportunity for me to have give the pharmacy group some lessons about harm reduction and stuff like that. And, and also a lot of talk about assessment. And we're going to talk more about assessment in our journey, which uh, started out at the beginning where we, we weren't really sure what how we were going to assess things, um, because obviously, you know, if you're giving someone a managed alcohol program, you have to assess for withdrawal and you have to assess, assess for intoxication. So I, I think that that's the next page and maybe I kind of jumped the, the cue here. Um, but um, yeah, so when we started, it was like, um, how do we assess for, for um, Withdrawal. Well, everybody goes automatically to the CWA, right? Everybody says, well, we use CWA, but CWA is really the purpose of CWA is, is to make an assessment about how much benzodiazepine you're going to give them. It's a validated tool, but it's certainly not validated for a managed alcohol program. So, um, and then what does that number mean when you're giving someone a managed um a dose of alcohol doesn't mean you give them a dose or do you give them a benzodiazepine so um we we started out very clumsily in i don't know if that's a word in terms of assessment and then what about intoxication how do we how do we evaluate someone who's intoxicated uh, uh, there's no validated tool there's no um do we add up the score? And if they're this score, we cut back on the dose or if that score. So we never had any of that type of information because there was no information like it. In the community, they, they put together a wellness um, screener, what turned out to be a screener. And, and it was kind of a combination of both. And I, I maybe get Morgan to speak how, how that evolved because in, in acute care and in long-term care, we started out doing CWAS and neuro assessments and just saying, if they show signs of intoxication, hold the dose. Um, but now we've actually evolved into a new wellness uh, assessment document that kind of was born out of that that happened in the community. And we're also looking at tweaking it for long-term care. So maybe this is a good time for Morgan to stop, talk about how that wellness screener was born in community. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so definitely like the wellness uh, checker screener was, was born out of um, looking at the CWA, the pause assessments, um, as well as taking into account COVID uh, screening and then symptoms of intoxication. Um, I think that there's a slide later that has the wellness check. If not, it is um, linked um, on the internet and, and Brittany's posted it before. Um, yeah, so the wellness check is designed in a way that it can be delegated to our, our social work staff. Um, I am hopeful that one day we can also delegate this to unregulated care providers, because um, I would imagine um, this is felt across Canada. There's uh, an epic uh, shortage of staff, um, especially nurses. Uh, well, all staff really at this point, but um, 
you know, this is this is work that can that can be delegated as long as there's some, um, you know, medical direction and support. And as we know, across Canada, um, programs that aren't run through the health authority are, are mainly supported by unregulated care providers. Um, so it was kind of designed with uh, the intention that it, it will get there one day. But right now we're just at nursing staff and regulated health care providers. So how it works in, in the community is um, clients are, are seen by the nurse uh, until stable on their dose. So when we're starting someone on IMAP, that looks similar to what you would um, see in detox. We kind of have like a seven to 10 day kind of window uh, to stabilize folks. And then once um, they're stable on their dose, um, if they don't have any other kind of complex medical needs or are also receiving narcotics, for example, then they would be um, designated as, as social work visits. Um, and the social workers will do the wellness script check form and have uh, very specific criteria uh, about when they reach out to the nurse. Um, those clients that aren't seen by the nurse twice a day still have scheduled visits. Um, and yeah, it is, um, it is pretty straightforward, but it is also nuanced in the work. So, um, you know, for some of our clients, their baseline um, looks very different than the new URI if we had like 10 warm luckies at <laughs> eight in the morning. So we also have a care plan document that really highlights that the baseline that folks are at, um, as well as signs of decompensation. Um, we do also um, moderate their dosing. So if we show up for our PM uh, screening and delivery and the client still has two beers left over from the morning, we do hold two beers um, for the evening. So uh, I'm not sure how, how far I should kind of talk down this uh, rabbit yeah. hole. So <laughs> yeah, I'll, it's a big one. Like in acute yeah. care, our, our wellness assessment has evolved for the activated site. So it's electronic to be some vitals, yeah. a modification of CWA with a score, and then an assessment of intoxication with a yes, no compared to baseline. And we've just in the last couple of weeks kind of solidified that at, um, for use in acute care. And now our next task is how does that fit into long-term care? And it could be the same assessment with just what is the frequency of assessment in acute care. Yeah. They would do the wellness assessment before each dose, but in long-term care, once someone's stabilized, they may just, we may just go to, and we haven't talked about this yet, to a screener for uh, unregulated health like healthcare aides in long-term care to just screen people. And then if, if the screening shows a problem, then uh, going to the more robust assessment and increasing the frequency. So we're, we're still fine tuning this as we go along. And, and sorry, I should have clarified for our wellness check. It's, it's um, we're asking people kind of yes, no questions around symptoms. And then as well as like what we're observing. So are they unsteady? Do they have poor balance, slurred speech, response time um, as indicators of intoxication? And then the withdrawal assessment would be similar to your CWA assessment, you know, observing uh, tremors, any nausea, vomiting, that sort craving. of thing. Craving. And yeah. we asked them about cravings. Yeah. yeah. Should we move? Uh, the only, oh. Maybe just one little thing that I, neither of you spoke to that I think is really uh, cool and important is the patient client resident self assessment. And so, um, what we learned while we were going up and down the island with education, and also what we learned um, in some of the principles of uh, the evidence that we reviewed is the importance of involving um, people who have an IMAP care plan in their own titration, in their own dosing schedule. And in order to do that, one of the things that we, tools that we created was a, a self-assessment where we would leave a, a sort of way to document for the individual if they wanted to, they don't have to, but if they wanted to, they could write about their cravings, when they're happening, what's maybe happening about that. And then 
um, that tool is provided to those that would like to interact in that manner. Um, and then I guess maybe just see what's out. One last thing on order sets. Uh, each of the order sets that we've shared with Brittany to post on the on the CMAPS page, um, they have different, slightly different criteria depending on the level of care. So for those that are interested in looking at them, you'll there's reasons for why they're different. And it's based on levels of acuity and um, also uh, what's, you know, generally speaking, what's typical based on a different population. So moving to the last two slides before we open it up, and sorry we went longer than 20 minutes, I lied. Um, maybe the policy and procedure page, uh, do, we, do either of you want to go into that or do you want me to quickly fly over? Yeah, I think um, the next couple slides, Nick, kind of go into more detail. So there was, we didn't actually queue anyone for that page yet. So maybe what I'll say is um, on the individualized managed alcohol plan for inpatient, we actually started drafting these in September 2020. So maybe six, what, eight months before um, being significantly affected by COVID. And in that process, we basically charted out what we thought was going to be best um, at the time. And uh, it started moving through governance um, uh, for approvals. Uh, and the last presentation that we did for it was at the uh, Mental Health Quality Council for endorsement and approval. And it was that was February 25th, 2020. And then um, we all know what happened after that. And so wanting everyone to be just sort of aware that between this slide and the next slide, there's a lot of similarity with some slightly different nuances that Donna spoke at the very beginning of the presentation. And so, you know, like you'll see, uh, you know, the way that um, pharmacy actually is the supply chain um, for inpatient versus in the community on the second bullet, it's a different supply chain, but similar storage requirements. And, um, you know, when you look at the third bullet on the first one, it's about these are the regulated professionals that are providing the, the ordering and the administration. And there's an additional um, in the community scenario for social work and, um, and, and so on. The, the, the piece that we're still working on right now, um, this week, every week for the next few uh, months is building out what it actually will look like for long-term care because the, um, the workflow for long-term care is a little different than community and, and in, in patient. Do either of you wanna say anything else before we? I think that just, you know, this is what, <clears throat> two years later and, and it's time for us to go back to the original policy and procedure because uh -huh. I quickly reviewed it and I said, oh, we're not doing that anymore. We're not doing that. Oh, we've, we've, you know, um, we've evolved here. And so, so already, you know, we're, we're tweaking as we go and we, we need to, we need to revamp our PMPs for sure. I don't know whose dog that is, but <laughs> Very but, cute. Uh, but their, the dog's name is Mia. And so are there any, are there, uh, maybe we could, uh, Brittany, do we want to hand it back over to you? And and then. Um, yeah, that sounds great. Maybe, should I shop, stop <laughs> sharing screen maybe? And, yeah, that sounds perfect. Um, maybe I'll just stop the recording now and we can move forward. Um,